Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, the years together, the solo years, what's going on in the, in the news, their music, their history, anything we feel like. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of the show. Hopefully you know me for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing. And I also co-host another Beatles talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, which is all about the solo Beatle years. And I'm being joined by my two other regulars. First of all, a man who has written a couple of Beatle books, including From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also Got That Something. How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. For many years, he worked in the classical department writing for the New York Times. And he's a freelance writer now, currently working on a Paul McCartney book. And that is our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. And hello, everyone. And Happy New Year. Yes. Happy New Year to you all. Happy 2020. Our other co-host just started his 37th year. Quite a milestone right there on New York's WFUV. He is their Beatle expert at the radio station. He's done a ton of great interviews and even uh, specials on the Beatles, including a Beatles Christmas special. And that's our very own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hello, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hello, Alan. Hello, all my friends. Happy New Year and welcome to our first show of 2020, 37 years and many, many pounds and a lot less hair later, uh, here I am. <laughs> and speaking of hair, by the way, our co-host, Alan Cozen, okay, <laughs> uh, cut off his l- luxurious locks, I understand. Now, I know this is a podcast, and many of you might not know what Alan looked like, but uh, Alan cut off the, uh, the hair, well, from what I understand. Some of it. I still have plenty. Well, I didn't shave his head, but he took a few inches off. <laughs> I, um, I had a ponytail until last week, and now I don't. So it's sort of like that. Was it a gardening accident, or was it a, a, a decision, that you conscious decision you made? <laughs> it was kind of neither. It was uh, Paula, my wife, saying, um, you know, want me to take a little bit off the bottom of your hair, you know, which makes sense to do every now and then. And I said, uh, yeah, sure. And then suddenly um, a lot more of it was gone. And I thought, you know what? I've had this ponytail since like 2002 or something. And it's, you know, might as well go for a while without one. See what, see if I miss it. If I miss it, it'll grow back. That's quite a long time to have a ponytail. I thought you were trying to copy the uh, 1989 Ringo look. <laughs> no, it's not quite that extreme. <laughs> <laughs> when he first toured, he had I, that I was ponytail. Talking. That's right. Yeah. When I heard you cut it, did you save it for me? Because I could sure as heck use some extra hair. <laughs> no. It doesn't matter the color or the texture. Just I like, glue it on and, you know. Ah, uh, Sadly, I didn't think of it. Sorry, Darren. I, I always thought think you of were that gonna... Saturday Night Live skit where they had the chia head. So like the bowl guy, <laughs> you know, cover your head with chia seeds and. Oh dear. Yeah. Anyway, enough air. <laughs> well, I thought I thought you you were gonna um, save it and sell it for peace. Oh yeah, I could have <laughs> done that too. Well, you know. <laughs> Actually, Ken, you and I could have like. I bagged some of Alan's hair and sold it like a, in the well, 60s. In fact, Beatles. it would have been the 50th anniversary of John doing that, actually. I should have, uh, should have thought it through. Yes, but, you should have honored that. Yeah. Jeez. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Enough on this hair-raising topic. Yeah. Ooh. So our main topic for the show at this time, our first show of 2020, we're going to be looking back at 2019. And we're each going to mention what we feel were the top highlights of the year for each of us and also do our wish list for 2020. I always like to do this. I've been doing this on the radio since the 80s, live, talking about the past year and talking about what I'd like to see in the coming year. So we're carrying on with that tradition. We've done it before on this show. We're doing it again right now. But first, we're going to start with the latest in Beatle news. And there's quite a bit to get to. 
we start off this year, unfortunately, by reporting the passing of someone uh, very special to us in the Beatle world. And it was such a shock for all of us that um, it was so unexpected. And that is the passing of Neil Innes. Neil was a part of the uh, music comedy troupe, the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. They appeared in the Beatles film Magical Mystery Tour, where they performed in a cabaret and sang their song Death Cab for Cutie, which uh, inspired the name of the band. The Bonzos also scored a top 10 hit in the UK with their biggest hit ever called I'm the Urban Spaceman, which was produced by Paul McCartney. And in fact, Paul played the ukulele on the song. He is often labeled, Neil is often labeled as the seventh Python, and he helped out Monty Python on occasion, including being in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, writing and singing the Brave Sir Robin song. Neil helped out uh, Eric Idle with his Rutland weekend te uh, television show, and he appeared in one show where George Harrison came on and sang the pirate song. Neil was in the band backing him up. Neil also appeared in George's videos for Cracker Box Palace, where he was pushing the baby pram with George's head sticking out the very beginning of mm -hmm. that video. And also, he was in the True Love video, where he played the part of a guardian angel, since that's part of the lyrics of the song. And uh, the funny part of that is, and I didn't know about this till I interviewed Neil about it, but there is a newspaper in the UK called The Guardian, and he was reading it. <laughs> right there in the video, Guardian Angel. We all know him best for his role as Ron Nasty in the Ruddles, uh, where he wrote their brilliant songs, two albums, the Ruddles and the Ruddles Archaeology. There was a Ruddles tour last year in the UK. This was back in March. And Neil just released a new solo album called Nearly Really, which Darren has a copy of he's going to talk about in just a few moments and um on his passing i have a quote here from mark lewison he says deeply saddened by the death of neil innes i fell for neil's humor and humanity with the rutland weekend television album in 1976 that's another thing you worked on that with eric idol big fan ever since and saw and met him many but not enough times loved his brilliant witty music loved him Mankind will miss his wry, sagely wisdom. There's also kind words coming from John Cleese and Michael Palin on Neil's passing. And um, as I mentioned before, I did an interview with Neil. And we, in fact, here at Things We Said Today, did an interview with Neil. This was in February of 2018 to promote the Fest for Beatle fans where he was about to appear. And um, delightful man, funny as could be. If you would like to hear our interview with Neil, you can go back to show number 263. And my interview with him is on my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. It's on interviews page four. You guys want to comment about Neil? Don't know that I you could put it better than Mark did. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, the Ruddles were, you know, were the Ruddles. I mean, I, I don't think any of our listeners need to be sold on the Ruddles. It, it was it was a spectacular parody of the Beatles and Bonzo Duda Dog Band. You know, was great in its way. Uh, his contributions to Python also are, you know, important. And and uh, and he was a funny guy. And as uh, as as Mark basically said, he made the world a, a better place. Um, for you know when you got to hear you know whatever his current project was or his or his or his back catalog so yeah that's it it was it was it was kind of a shock you know i mean i i didn't know that, that he was ill or anything and uh you know it was sort of shocking to open the paper and see that mm. i don't think yeah. it was it i think it was pretty much uh sudden yeah i don't think he had any health issues at least nothing that was you know, uh, uh, the family knew about. I think it just was his time, unfortunately, for, for us. Maybe fortunately mm -hmm. for him, depending on, you know, what you think about, you know, that moment. But uh, it was such a sudden, tragic loss that came out of left field. Uh, and, I mean, 
I have, I'm going to break into a Frank Sinatra song now, regrets, I uh, have a few. I mean, I always think about the things that, um, that I uh, haven't done in my career, opportunities that kind of came past me that I didn't uh, take advantage of. And one of them, Beatle related, was getting to enjoy the talents of Neil Innes more. He was a, a frequent guest at the Fest for Beatle fans. And I really only uh, saw him perform or, or speak on a handful of uh, uh, instances. And I really wish that uh, I would have, um, uh, I really wish I would have uh, done more, seen more, heard more, perhaps got to say hello to him in person. So many people that Ken and I know and uh, at uh, the Fest for Beatle fans, the New York, New Jersey Fest, knew him on a first name basis. He was a down-to-earth regular guy, and I unfortunately, uh, for numerous reasons, never really had that opportunity. But when we were recording a show, one of these uh, shows, one of the things we said today a few months back in the news, Ken, you mentioned that Neil had a new album out. And once we were finished with the show, I went digging around and uh, decided to order a copy. The album's Nearly Really, which is not easy to say. The album covers kind of a parody of uh, the Elvis Presley album, the first Elvis Presley album, where, you know, the letters are on the left-hand side in pink, and then along the bottom they're in green. The Clash uh, modeled London Calling in that style. And that's how it's done on Neil. Um, when I went to the website, and the, there is a website specifically for the album, nearlyreally.com, uh, and you can order the album there. In fact, all of the album notes are there, and the lyrics are on the website. If you get the CD, you can scan. There's one of those little codes where you can scan it on your phone or your tablet and be brought to the website so that you could see the song lyrics and everything. Uh, so when I got to the website, I was reading how Neil had brought the Kickstarter people into the project to help fund the album. And Kickstarter, some of you may know, some of you may not know, went, uh, I guess they went bankrupt. They went belly up. And if you ordered something from them, which I did unrelated to the Beatles, I had ordered a rather pricey box set uh, through Kickstarter. You were out of luck. I'm out of my money. I don't have my box set. This was a situation that was happening to the people who had donated to Neil's album. And he was very apologetic about it. The website has instructions on how you could attempt to go about getting your money back or, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, getting your cash for the CD. And then you could order it directly from Neil. Uh, and the uh, online store, by the way, is still open. It's open now despite Neil's passing. Uh, where you can order nearly, really, and uh, some of the uh, older collections uh, that he has out. I'm not terribly familiar with Neil's solo work uh, and his recordings, so I was extremely pleasantly surprised at how good uh, this album is. And, uh, you know, if I was able to put together my uh, year-end uh, list album list of 2019, which we do every year at WFUV. All the DJs put together a list of their top albums and songs of the year. Had I made the list up a little later, uh, I would have included it. It's that good. It's a really, really terrific, uh, nearly really 16 songs. Some of them are serious pop rock tunes that are dynamite. Some of them are kind of tongue in cheek and fun, filled with Neil's humor. Uh, there's a tune on the album called Different Ways, which sounds like something that uh, Ringo could have covered. Uh, the first song on the album is kind of a playful uh, ukulele-based tune, Old Age Becomes Me. Uh, another one of the highlights is a track called Cats Don't Like the Rain. Uh, <laughs> Soft Shoe Shuffle is classic Python-esque type humor. Uh, and then there's a pretty much straight-ahead uh, pop rock tunes on here uh uh like uh now i can't read my notes of course what's number six i so don't care uh, is one of them folks song is another uh there's a live track which is pretty funny called surely in the morning where there is a line i should pull up the exact lyric but it basically has to do with the fact that uh, i don't 
he was talking to his wife, wakes up in the morning, tells his wife, I'm not a camper, but there's a tent pole in the bed with us. Something <laughs> to that effect. It's very funny. It's a very, very, very charming album. I uh, just noticed that it was recorded in Australia. I'm looking at the liner notes now. And um, listen, it's an introduction to his own individual work for me. If you're not that familiar with Neil Innes, it's a definite good place to start. And it is very sad that, uh, you know, the album finally did become available on his website. And now uh, he's no longer with us. And I will cherish the little postcard that came with the CD uh, where he hand wrote a thank you for per- uh, the album. So uh, uh, it's it's a terrific record. And I still my top album list for 2019 has been posted on WFEV's website. For numerous weeks now, I still haven't gotten around to put it on my Facebook page. Uh, and I think what I'll do is I'll put it with a little addition, additional mention, because uh, the record is really that strong. It's just a shame, you know, aren't going to hear it, aren't going to know about it. If you're familiar with here in the U.S., if you're familiar with Loudon Wainwright III, and I'm a big Loudon Wainwright III fan, there are occasions where the humor is along the same kind of folk-based folk-based songs with that sort of humor uh, and then there's serious stuff and there's some pretty powerful tunes on there so uh so that's the album nearly really unfortunately the last album from neil Innes released during his lifetime yeah i'm gonna have to make sure i pick up a copy of that and um i will say i really cherish the two interviews that i was involved with with neil i just listened back to the one that i did yesterday and um the memories came back remembering the stories that he told and he was just so incredibly funny and you learn so much in this one hour with neil about how the ruddles all started and how uh, the bonzo dog band got to be in magical mystery tour there is a story in there that i will tell you um it's much better if neil <laughs> says it in his own words but Apparently, Elvis Presley was a huge Monty Python fan, and he loved Monty Python and the Holy Grail to the to the point where he knew all the dialogue really well, and he imitated all the different members of Monty Python. And so um, Neil actually does sing Brave Sir Robin <laughs> in Elvis's voice, <laughs> which That's is funny. hysterical. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, there's so many great stories that he shared with me, and uh, I'm going to treasure that time. And I'm also going to be listening back to our interview. You know, he's very revealing about his life and uh, so many stories. I mean, just hanging around the people that he did, just working with the Bonzos and Monty Python. He did tell me that there is um, a magazine. I'm not sure if it still exists in Japan called Strange Days, and it's totally devoted to the Bonzo Dog Band, the Beatles, Mighty Python, and the Ruddles, and nothing else. Because, <laughs> you know, it's all from the same family, <laughs> as, well, as well as the goons, if you want to go that far back. So, um, yeah, if you get a chance, check it out. Our show, which I said is number 263, and the one on my website. All right? That, just uh, found that lyric. The song was Surly in the Morning. I think I said Shirley in the Morning. Surly in the Morning. Um, and, uh, honey, please forgive me. I'm hung over and horny again. And then later in the song, surly in the morning, black dog howling in my head, honey, you know, I ain't no boy scout, but there's a tent pole in our bed. Uh, and it's that kind of, you know, funny humor that pops up here and there on the songs on, uh, on the album. Some good stuff. Neil Innes. He was just so good at that. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we have another passing to announce here, and that is of Les Chadwick, who was the bass player for Jerry and the Pacemakers. The group was the second pop act signed by Brian Epstein, and they were also produced by George Martin. Les stayed with the group until their split in 1966. Other news, according to an internal Universal Music catalog of upcoming releases, I'm sure most of our listeners know about this, Paul McCartney's Flaming Pie will be the next of his archive releases to get the royal treatment, remastering with a box set. The release date 
is set for July 24th with a limited deluxe edition containing five CDs and two DVDs. Five CDs. That's tremendous. Mm. Okay, I wonder what could be on there. You know, I'm wondering if, because if you followed all the CD, the CD singles that came out with Flaming Pie, there was a lot of Ubu Jubu stuff, you know, segments from his radio series called Ubu Jubu with songs in there, unreleased songs. So I'm wondering if that's going to be reissued in this package. There's no telling what could be on there, but five CDs, it's a ton of material and two DVDs. Mm hmm. So all this time, we didn't know if it was going to be London Town and Back to the Egg, and then we heard about Flaming Pie, and now it's it's pretty much official. Yeah, that sounds great. Mm. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, it looks like Peter Jackson's documentary on the Get Back Let It Be sessions will be coming out in October. However, a companion book called Get Back the Beatles has been spotted on Amazon, and it is described this way. The authorized story of the making of the Let It Be album and the Beatles' breakup, told through exclusive photographs, transcripts of the recording sessions, and an essay by British playwright and novelist Hanif Qureshi. Release date for the book is October 15th. Retails for $49.99 hardcover. The publisher is Callaway Arts and Entertainment. So we do know that the Peter Jackson documentary comes out in October, as does this book. We don't know about the audio part of Let It Be, kind of hoping that it will be on the 50th anniversary in May, but we haven't heard any definite word about that. Right. Or maybe, maybe it'll all come out in October. Or maybe it'll really all come out in May. Well, no, we know that the, the Peter Jackson one comes out in October. Well, we don't know that. We know that one website said so, and the, the book is listed on Amazon for around that time, but we don't have an official word of when the Peter Jackson is coming out, so I'm still holding out for May. <laughs> and we had discussed, uh, I think, a couple of shows ago that the original cut of the Let It Be movie is also supposed to be part of something in coming out in addition yeah. to Peter Jackson's film, right? Yeah, that was what they originally announced. Going to hold you to that. Yep. <laughs> then there's the other possibility that maybe in May, Peter Jackson film will be screened mm -hmm. in theaters or on something like Netflix, but it won't be physically out until October. Well, I guess that remains to be seen. So <laughs> confuse everyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We get information here in drips and drabs, mm -hmm. and hopefully we'll have some definitive words soon. Mm -hmm. All right. Mary McCartney is now a TV star. She has a new TV series, a cooking show, which premiered on the Food Network on January 5th called Mary McCartney Serves It Up. Her very first guest on the show was Stanley Tucci. She's also working with the Food Network to host a series of on-demand cooking classes, which you can get through the Food Network Kitchen app. The classes and the TV show will showcase Mary's vegetarian meals. I can tell you that that first show that I just mentioned with Stanley Tucci will be rebroadcast on the Food Network on January 17th at 12.30 p.m., and that's Eastern Time. If did you, you are, see the show? I did not. I, I saw forgot. about uh, 15 or 20 minutes of it. And what did you uh, think? She's very charming, but watching her eat uh, meatless burgers with Stanley Tucci after a while, I kind of, I had my fill, no pun intended. But uh, it seemed like it's a fantastic idea in this day of, you know, so many folks who are vegetarian and vegan. Right. Uh, you know, if, she, if there was any interest in that being a weekly thing, I, I would think it would have legs. It certainly can in this day and age. And you also have to thank Linda for that, for getting the ball rolling. Right. She could have us on as a guest and make meatless tacos for the things we said today, hosts. <laughs> Why don't we send that in as a suggestion? <laughs> here? A few more things. If you are a Star Wars fan. Slashfilm.com reports that the new film, The Rise of Skywalker, includes a number of stormtroopers being played by famous people, one of which happens to be Danny Harrison. 
Wow. Okay. Wow. He was involved in the film playing FN0802. <laughs> I don't think that uh, he has any dialogue in the, in the movie. And producer Nigel Godrich is also a stormtrooper. Wow. He brought a lot of chaos and creation into the film. Mm-hmm. He plays FN2802. Oh, okay. not that character. <laughs> so now we'll all have to watch the movie for that, for that reason alone. For I can't Danny and for Nigel. Star Wars movies. What's the name of this one? The Rise of Skywalker. Nothing is oh, Beetle that Proof. <laughs> That's true. There you when go. That's that proof of that. It's already out, Darren. Oh, oh, it's the one that's out already. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can't keep up. I get confused easily. All right. Some Beetle book news. The ever busy Ken Womack, who are already. Uh, authored several Beatle books like The Beatles Encyclopedia, a two-part biography on the life and career of George Martin, Maximum Volume, and Sound Pictures, and the recent book on the Abbey Road album, Solid State, has another one coming out, and it's called The Beatles in Context. Amazon writes that the book brings together key themes to better explore the Beatles' lives and work and understand their cultural legacy. Expect that one out in March. There's also a new Paul McCartney book coming out this month, called the Paul McCartney Catalog, a complete annotated discography of solo works from 1967 through 2019 by Ted Montgomery. It's 200 pages long. I'll be finding out more about it in the next few weeks. Okay. Beatle fans who are fans of the band Government Mule. Could that be you as well, Darren? Yes, I am a big fan of Government Mule. Warren Haynes is fabulous. Okay. Well, when they played New Year's Eve at the Beacon Theater in New York City, they actually covered 10 Beatles songs in concert. Obviously, they were in a Let It Be and Abbey Road mood because they performed Get Back, Don't Let Me Down, I've Got a Feeling, One After 909, and Dig a Pony. Then after All Lang Syne, they really should have done Ding Dong, Ding Dong. After that, they did Come Together, Oh Darling, Something, I Want You, She's So Heavy, and The End. And the previous night at the Beacon, they performed She Said, She Said, Tomorrow Never Knows, Anya Burke Can Sing, and Revolution. Big Beatle fans, they are. Yeah, the government mule's great. I've had Warren Haynes on as a guest on FUV uh, oh, three or four, maybe five times. He's a really, really great guy, and he's an unreal guitarist. And uh, the, uh, the brothers, if you heard about the brothers, it's the surviving members of the Allman Brothers family are doing... Uh, uh, a show in March. I don't have the information in front of me, but and they're calling themselves the Brothers. All right, all right. Thank you, Darren. Uh, the Fest for Beetle fans is coming up. It's the weekend of March 27th through the 29th at the Hyatt Regency, Jersey City on the Hudson. Special guests include Jenny Boyd, the sister of Patty Boyd, with her new book called Jennifer Juniper, of which the song was named from Donovan. Billy J. Kramer will be there premiering a new single. Someone that's never been at the fest, although I don't think Jenny Boyd has ever been at the fest, but uh, a newcomer includes Don Deniman from the band The Circle. And they, of course, toured with the Beatles in 1966. They were managed by Brian Epstein. You know their big hit, Red Rubber Ball. At least I hope you do. And then the follow-up, Turn Down Day. So uh, he will be there. And, of course, there's Lawrence Juber who will be premiering his latest CD of Beatles songs called The Fab Fourth. Okay? If you need more information, you can go to thefest.com. A few more things. The Weakling's new album, Three, is being released on January the 17th. It'll be coming out on Collector's Edition Blue Vinyl and CD. It includes their remake of Friday on My Mind with Peter Noon. (laughs) <laughs> also, their cover of Baby, You're a Rich Man is on there and their new single called In the Moment. And finally, I, I want to let everyone know that since a lot of Beatle fans are also Monkees fans, there will be a Peter Tork Memorial Convention happening in Connecticut in New Haven on February the 8th at the Best Western Plus. Special guests will be there as well as Monkees merchandise and memorabilia. Okay, that's it for Beatle News. Right. Very good. So, why don't we get on to our main topic, which is 2019 followed by 2020. We're going to each list what we feel are the biggest highlights for ourselves, our favorite moments 
of 2019. It could be an audio release, a video release, a book release, a concert, whatever comes to mind. And uh, I thought I'd start with Alan. I thought that we might uh, each mention five. And if you want to have honorable mentions, you can do so as well. Okay. There's an, actually quite a bit for 2019. Um, it's surprising how much stuff came out. Really. Yeah, yeah. No Paul McCartney album as such, apart from two versions of the album from 2018, um, Traveler's Edition, which I have that suitcase, um, <laughs> and <laughs> and the Explorer's Edition. But there were, you know, a, a, a couple of singles from there. Um, so we're slowly getting more uh, Egypt Station material. But seeing as the Egypt Station stuff is really from the previous year, I'm going to skip that. And uh, instead in the sort of Paul department is another pricey release that um, I picked up because I apparently don't know how to handle money even at my age. And that is, <laughs> and that is the $2,000 edition of Linda's Fo Polaroids, which is a really nice book. There is a trade version of it too, which I also got because for sort of, you know, daily handling, you don't want to get a two thousand dollar book to sort of even though it yeah, does Andy. come it comes with a pair of gloves <laughs> so what? you know keep pages clean all that stuff um it's you know it's her polaroids from really over an extended period of time um a disappointing thing about it is that you know the, the polaroids are not always captioned in the most informative way. I mean, sometimes there, there are some with people in them who you don't know and the captions don't help you. It's also a little bit light on dates and um, a little vague on locations. But, you know, if you just want to enjoy the pictures, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a really nicely done book. Um, and, you know, they're Polaroids. I mean, we're sort of slowly getting this um, glimpse of, you know, over the years with Linda's books coming out, I think starting in around 74, you know, we get to see a little bit more each time. And, you know, she took some great stuff and the Polaroids were obviously very casual, but, you know, they show sort of, you know, Paul at home and the kids and, you know, just, just sort of what their daily life was to some degree. Let's see. Uh, so I would, I'd count that as one. Is that mainly family photos? Mainly family photos and, you know, Paul at work and or Paul having fun, kids having fun. It's, it's, it's all different kinds of stuff. It's very hard to characterize. But it's kind of like, you know, someone's, some family's collection of Polaroids. It's just that we happen to know this particular family. So it's not... You know, like looking at someone you don't know is Polaroids, obviously. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, they say every picture tells a story, or Rod Stewart did anyway. And, uh, you know, you, you can kind of see, you, you get a lot of information from these photos. I wish the captions gave you some more information, but um, but it is sort of what it is. And I think the, the limited edition, I mean, there, there are a couple of different levels. I actually did not get the highest level because that was sort of beyond uh, what seemed even vaguely responsible. But I think, I think the first 125 copies are, you know, the, the, the top level, I can't remember what it costs. And then the $2,000 edition is like copy number 125 to 500 or something like that. And they're autographed by Paul, which is also sort of nice, you know. So let's see. I suppose, I mean, I don't know if this counts, so I'm not going to count it as one of my five. But in 2019, um, Adrian Sinclair and I got our contract to do the first two volumes of the McCartney Legacy. Um, Yay. So that's, <laughs> that's fun and work. And uh, Apparently, um, you know, we didn't have to pay for it, so, <laughs> so that's good. Abbey Road reissue. I mean, Abbey Road reissue really would probably be my number one for the year. There are things I wish it had more of, like 
outtakes. <laughs> but I like the surround sound. I liked the new mix. I liked the book that comes with it. Beautifully illustrated, lots of handy stuff in there if you're into information, which I am. Um, and, uh, you know, the, all of these reissues are you know, really well done. And, um, I think Abbey Road just sounds spectacular. It always sounded really good. It sounds really spectacular now. Ringo's What's My Name. Um, mm -hmm. one of his better albums, I think, uh, of recent times and, um, sort of enjoyed it. We, we, ha I think had a show about it, uh, you know, not long ago when it came out. So, uh, won't go on it much more length but let's say what have i got now one two three kind of got a kick out of uh john lennon imagine raw studio mixes that were released on lp for record store day i mean i had all the tracks on the cd set um and obviously you can make your own sequence that is just like the lp but it's nice having it on lp and it uh you know it plays well and it's a uh, it's a nice little piece to have and has not subsequently come out on CD in that form. So the LP is, uh, you know, certainly a collector's item. The last one for me would be Danny Boyle's Yesterday. I've read a lot of criticism of it. I love that film. You know, it's really just, I think, like I said, when we discussed it when it came out it's really just sort of a cinematic love letter to the beatles catalog and i can't argue with that obviously some holes in you know in the story but you know it's going to have holes in the story that's not the point i just thought it was well done and i kind of like the concept and to be sort of in a theater here in a couple of hours of, of performances of beatles songs is not a bad thing generally speaking so <laughs> So those are my five. Mm. Just wondering what you thought about, I, I just read an article that was in Beatle Fan from one of the writers about how he was upset with how skimpy he felt uh, the amount of material was in the Abbey Road box set. Yeah, Mike Edsel. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, I think it was a bit skimpier than, say, the White Album release. Um, and it didn't have as many surprises as the White Album release. Like, you know, for instance, the White Album's, you know, partial run through of Let It Be, of all things. I don't think anybody expected that. There's nothing like that on Abbey Road. And when it comes down to it, the outtakes were on two CDs, but added up to like 86 minutes, which is si only six minutes more than you can fit on one CD. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It's always great to have more and I wish they put more on. But that said, I, I was pretty satisfied with, with what we got there. Would have liked yeah. more, but what they put out was, was good. Yeah. I kind of, um, I'm very surprised. I'm very satisfied with what came out of the Abbey Road box set, but it did leave me wanting more. And, um, you know, I still don't understand why they couldn't have put a studio outtake of the band doing something. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be missing. You know, it's nice to have the demo, especially adding the piano in it. But I don't know why there wasn't something to represent something yeah. uh, as a studio outtake. Yeah. Darren, how about your top five? All right. Well, um, at the top of my list, and I'm not going to get into the details because Alan touched on it a little bit. We've talked, done full shows on it. The 50th anniversary Abbey Road reissues in one big uh, ball would be at the top of my list. The box set, the individual discs, all related books. It's my favorite Beatle album. I love the treatment that uh, these landmark albums of the Beatles, they're all landmark albums, but uh, starting with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, uh, I really love the treatment these albums have been getting, looking forward to all the Let It Be stuff. And then I'm actually very interested to see what they'll do beyond Let It Be when we've done the 50, last 50th anniversary. And yet there is still, you know, Will they go back and Revolver, I'm sure, could use a box set? I'm sure there's a box set in there for Rubber Soul. When and how will all that be handled? But uh, anyway, getting ahead of myself. So at the top of my list, all things Abbey Road 50th anniversary. But to pull something out of that, 
uh, that was a personal highlight for me this year was the opportunity of getting to go in August to a, a universal listening uh, that took place in uh, Dolby Studios in Midtown Manhattan. And uh, it was an opportunity for the press several weeks before the uh, anniversary reissues came out to listen to samples of uh, both the new remix of the album and uh, samples of the sessions and a sampling of the uh, Dolby Atmos mix, which is part of the big deluxe box set. I was at one of the sessions, Ken was with me uh, last year, 2018 actually, for the White Album 50th. I was not at the uh, Sgt. Pepper one. They're always a lot of fun to go into these private state-of-the-art studios and have an expert walk you through these iconic uh, songs that we have lived our lives with and hearing them in uh, ways that uh, shed new light. In the case of, if I could get into a, I'll try to keep it as quick as possible and tell it as briefly as possible, but a funny coincidence uh, that happened for me on a personal note, in August, the Abbey Road set was hosted by an individual who worked for Universal Music in London. And this was because Giles Martin, who I'm assuming was at the Sgt. Pepper one uh, in 2017, yes. definitely uh, the host of the White Album sessions. Giles was unavailable because he had suffered an injury that prevented him from flying to the United States in August. Uh, so a representative of Universal Music did the presentation in place of Giles Martin. Uh, okay, so that's fine. Uh, I spoke to him briefly. At the time, I was still on crutches recovering from my uh, knee injury, uh, which happened back in May. Okay, so that was fine. Uh, fast forward a couple of months, and my daughter is going for her master's at a college in London. And she has a part-time. And it turns out that one of the women she works with at this part-time job happens to be very close friends with this guy from Universal Music. Huh. Uh, and somehow, one day at work, my daughter got to talking with uh, one of the older women uh, that she works with at this job, and they're somehow the Beatles and radio and me came up in the conversation. And she mentioned to, uh, to my daughter, you know, a, a family friend, my dear friend's husband works for Universal, the Beatles record company. And uh, my daughter told me, and I don't recall now how I just took a shot and threw the name out. Turned out it was the same guy. And we've had uh, some correspondence since then. And thankfully, I was on crutches in August because I could refer to myself as the guy at the listening session that was on crutches. And he did remember and was able to uh, connect uh, me with that individual. So that's kind of crazy. It's a small world uh, and oh. it's a strange <laughs> But uh, anyway, so that was Abbey Road. And that uh, that listening session kind of was my little special moment out of the whole Abbey Road 50th anniversary things. So that would be number one. Number two for me uh, would have to be Ringo's latest album, What's My Name? One of my favorite records of the year. Uh, no surprise there. Uh, a consistently solid, another consistently solid pop rock album from Ringo. Now, there are sure some of you out there that like, uh, you know, maybe like aren't crazy for Ringo 2012, but love Liverpool 8 or love Vertical Man, but you're not crazy about why not, whatever the case might be. In a nutshell, Ringo has been on some artistic runs, starting with Time Takes Time, where even an album that you might think is one of his weaker albums has some strong moments on it. And the albums are generally speaking all consistently enjoyable. And you could add what's my name to that list. And I also uh, was pleased. Uh, it seemed many people who might have been not terribly enamored with some of Ringo's recent albums really embraced this new one. Uh, so it was nice to see other people, quote unquote, getting it. So What's My Name would uh, be number two. And the uh, little bonus of that was seeing Ringo Starr and his all-star band. I guess it was, at the, yeah, it was in late August in New York City, mid-August. It was just after the Woodstock anniversary. 
uh, at uh, South Street Seaport, a new venue, Pier 17, uh, a rooftop venue right on the East River, an incredible view of Lower Manhattan and the East River and uh, the uh, you know, Queens and Brooklyn and the bridges over the East River behind uh, that you could see behind the stage uh, made for a very magical night and getting to see Ringo and uh, actually uh, sitting in better seats in front of both Jack Douglas and Mark Rivera, which was a lot of, uh, you know, I got a kick out of telling my wife, hey, we're sitting closer to the stage than both Jack Douglas and Mark Rivera. <laughs> <laughs> meant more to me than to, than to her, but so Ringo, what's my name in the All Star Band's uh, anniversary tour of 2019 would be my number two. Uh, my number three, the documentary Above Us Only Sky. Mm. Just when you thought you saw it all, when it came to Imagine, we had, of course, the Imagine reissue and the films coming out again, the John Lennon Imagine film and the making of the album. Give me some truth. Then along comes Above Us Only Sky, and they managed to uh, create something uh, just as enjoyable as the older films that had been reissued in 2018. And I'm thrilled that it came out on disc because I was initially afraid that it was not that it was going to be one of these, uh, you know, TV only deals. You could still watch it on Netflix, but there's nothing like physically owning uh, something like this. So. The doc, John and Yoko documentary Above Us Only Sky is at number three for me. Uh, in at number four, I'm going to put McCartney's live album Amoeba Gig. In a way, you could say that this is a new live album because it is, even though the majority of the material on the album has been out already. Uh, his uh, appearance at Amoeba Records in Los Angeles uh, to promote Memory Almost Full. First, uh, a selection of tracks came out as an EP, uh, which I think was called Amoeba's Secret, if I remember correctly. Um, it was then expanded to an album-length uh, uh, package called Live in Los Angeles. And now uh, it was expanded even more and reissued or released earlier this year as Amoeba Gig to go along with the uh, uh, re-release of uh, Wings Over America and Paul is Live and... Uh, the Russian album, right? Wow, my memory is not what it was. But those four albums it's almost out full on vinyl, <laughs> right. on vinyl and CD. And to me, Amoeba Gig really got lost in the shuffle as one of the four releases and should have been, I think, treated as an individual release because it immediately became one of my favorite live albums from McCartney. And more people should give it a listen rather than it being, oh, one of those four reissues. Um, right. Amoeba Gig, number four. And at number five, uh, a book uh, that I really thought in, in a sea of Beatle books that are out there, uh, we had the opportunity to interview the author here on Things We Said Today. I really enjoyed Terry Crane's book, uh, mm -hmm. NEMS and the Business of Selling Beatles Merchandise in the U.S., 1964 to 1966. A great way of looking at Beatle history through memorabilia and merchandise. And I don't know. I think it's the first book of its kind. And uh, so, it, you know, it, it kind of was probably the most often paged through book in uh, my house in 2019. So uh, Terry Crane's book uh, in at number five for me. OK, I have a feeling in my case, my honorable mentions will be far longer than my top five. <laughs> but uh to start things off, my number one uh, highlight of 2019 has to be Ringo's album, What's My Name? And I would pretty much uh, echo Darren's words. Thank you for saying what I've been consistently saying for so long about all of Ringo's albums since Time Takes Time have been amongst his best, really. He's been on a roll. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, from the post-Mark Hudson period, they're all very good, all consistently strong. I don't know if you'd call them great, but they're certainly solid, as you said, Darren. Very good right. albums. You know, I do like the new collaborations in there with Sam Hollander, uh, known for his work with Paddock at the Disco and Weezer. And um, there's two songs on there that Sam wrote. I loved all that. I love the new version of Grow Old With Me. Most of the songs on there I love a lot. 
you know, I'm not crazy about the new version of Money, but everything else on there I really enjoy on the new album. And a new album of all new material that you've never heard before always takes precedence for me over anything else, really, as long as it's at least a good album. And in this case, I would call it very good. I'm always grateful for any new albums that come from Ringo or Paul. And uh, What's My Name was has been a treat since it came out. Uh, my number two choice has to be the Abbey Road box set. I'm very pleased with how it came out. Um, so many highlights in the box set audio-wise would have to be earlier versions of The Ballad of John and Yoko and Old Brown Shoe, uh, the demos for Something and Goodbye. Just the orchestration alone on Something is just so absolutely stunning. And the uh, Golden Slumbers carry that weight orchestration as well. It's really uh, you know, wonderful to listen to. All the early takes. And just to know the whole process of how these songs took shape. And in this case, as I said when we were first reviewing Abbey Road, that so many of these songs, the arrangements were pretty much the same from start to finish. They didn't really change from the beginning uh, of, uh, of the songs on Abbey Road. It's a fascinating collection, and I always love um, the booklets that come with it, and in this case, all the, the great Linda McCartney photos that are in there. Really a job well done. I wish there could have been more, you know, but uh, very happy with it. I was going to uh, say, I mean, with all of these, all of these releases, we wish there could be more. But I don't know. I mean, the other side of the coin, if someone came up to you and said, oh, you wish there would be more. Uh, what, you know, you wouldn't give up what you got. You know what I mean? And you're still better off with, you know, with with what they offered there. But uh, for everything, you wish there would be more. You know, if there were two CDs, give us four. Right. Hmm. I don't know. For the White Album, I don't know how you could ask for more than what we got from the White Album. So uh, that's just me there. Also, I would say for number three, I'm going to group this all together, going against what Alan said. But the new McCartney songs that came out this year, even though they're from Egypt Station, they were new releases for 2019. Mm -hmm. And you had Get Enough. Frank Sinatra's Party, 62nd Street, and just recently, Home Tonight and In a Hurry. There's also the longer version of Who Cares, but that's not all that important to me. But those other songs were real highlights for the year. And, um, you know, anytime there's new material, I don't mind when it trickles out like this. It does kind of bother me when you have to buy the album all over again just to get a couple of new songs. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, these songs are really strong. We just did a show on Talk More Talk about Paul's B-sides and bonus tracks and how, in many cases, they're just as good, if not better, than some of the songs that are on the albums. And uh, with the exception of Get Enough, which I'm still kind of lukewarm on, I love those other songs from Paul. They could have easily have made it on the album. They shouldn't be looked at as being inferior, necessarily. Some of the stuff that Paul releases as bonus tracks, whether they're B-sides or on CD singles, or on 12-inch records. Some of them are really interesting and um, worthwhile to listen to. You know, we haven't even talked about Home Tonight and In a Hurry, those two McCartney songs. So maybe I'd like to just get uh, your impressions of those two, because uh, we, were, we didn't have a new show for several weeks there. So when, since we had Peter Asher on in the last show, we didn't get to talk about the new mccartney single what did you guys think of those two new songs yeah i like them actually um they had a a, a kind of um maybe 60s ish kind of sound into as songs you know and uh i thought they were okay don't really have a lot to say about them they were enjoyable and uh you know it does as you say ken it does make much more sense to release a couple of new songs as a single than to put the album out again with a few new songs and you've got to get the whole thing again, mm. um, sometimes in a suitcase. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, these were, you know, these weren't bad. I mean, you know, here's the thing with like, what you said also is true about how Paul's B sides are often, you know, equal to or better than some of the things on the album. I mean, that's been the case for a very long time. And, uh, you know, he records 
an awful lot for each album. And the problem that he faces, I, I, I once asked him about this, and it was shortly after, I guess, Flowers came out. And I asked, you know, why is something like um, Flying to My Home relegated to a B-side when, you know, it's it's better than some of the tracks on the album. I'm not, I'm not sure that when I asked the question, I mentioned any, but obviously I'm thinking of Oué Le Soleil, which is like, you know, come on. Um, sorry. Oh, Jim. stop. I love that song. <laughs> I, know, I, know. Say, Alan. I love it. I yeah, love yeah. it. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and, and basically what he said was, you know, I make the decisions about some of these things by playing them to my kids and my kids' friends. And he says, because the thing is, I like them all. I mean, I've written them. I've recorded them. It's, you know, at a certain point, it becomes difficult for me to choose. So basically, it's as if he sort of audience tests them. He just doesn't have the one-way mirror. You know, he plays them for a bunch of people and he gauges people's reaction to them as songs. You know, why something like Flying to My Home didn't get a better reaction than Ue Le Soleil, I don't know, you know. What can I say? It's just kids' friends. I don't know who they are. Maybe maybe it was Ken. <laughs> <laughs> What a kid! <laughs> I was there. What I a kid! <laughs> but yeah, you know the, the, that's the bottom line. Though he has a lot of really good stuff um, that isn't on the albums. Some of it hasn't even been released. I mean, we all have stacks of bootlegs of unreleased things, and there's some good stuff out there that he hasn't yet put out. So, uh, you know, hmm. it's an interesting thing about him. Darren, we all want to know what you think of the two new McCartney songs. Uh, I like, I get the names mixed up. Um, Home Tonight. Home Tonight is a really strong song. In a Hurry is okay. In a Hurry just strikes me as a B-side. A good song. Uh, a lot of people do like it. You know, to me, it's just sort of, okay. It's, it's okay. But uh, the A-side is, is really good. Home Tonight. Uh, but other than that, again, not primo McCartney, and I don't mean this, you know, to knock the songs in any way, but in a few years, it might be easy to forget that he put this single out. But, you know, I like them both. And Home Tonight's my preference of the two tracks. The picture disc is great. I kind of wish he would have put out a regular black vinyl edition or at least put out a CD single. I know, I know, I know. No one cares about the... CDs anymore, but uh, I do. You know, well, there's two of us, and Alan, I'll count <laughs> them as three. Yep. But you know, I know I don't know. Have any of you? Because uh, I haven't yet, because my turntable is not actually functioning at the moment. Have you listened to the picture disc? Nope. Either. I just have it as a digital file. Okay, uh, Alan, do you? Have I haven't. That is the physical I, single? No, I haven't because it's still sealed. Um, and I was able to get a, uh, a high resolution digital file, which is probably going to sound better than the single anyway. So um, until I can get a second copy that I can open and still have a sealed copy, I'm content with the digital files. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. I, I, like I said, I haven't been able to play it. I'm just curious about the quality because I know picture discs are. Uh, very uh, suspect, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so yeah, no, I like it. Don't get me wrong, I like it. I've listened to it a bunch of times in the car. Home tonight's a good track. In a hurry's nice, and it's in a hurry. Just again, to me, sounds like it's just a B side. Mm. Okay. Well, I really love those two songs, and in fact, home tonight is is so darn catchy couple of listens and it's stuck in my head and and with both those songs i really think his vocals sound great i don't yeah. hear any straining yeah. you know you hear so much about him now his aging voice it doesn't sound like it on these two songs and um i like the brass that she used in home tonight in a hurry i think is a much more interesting song because there's a lot more sections that he just attached to the song there and uh and I love his vocals on that one, too. And he put a lot more effort into his bass playing, which is really hot uh, in the mix for both these songs. I think they're really strong. And I'm finding more and more that I'm 
enjoying his bonus tracks quite a lot. Maybe because I'm so used to hearing what's on the album and I haven't spent as much time on his bonus tracks. But, uh, you know, some of his best material are what he leaves off his albums, like like we said uh, just before. And I kind of wish that B-Sides wouldn't have this connotation of it being inferior because, um, you know, we should have learned something from the Beatles catalog. (laughs) I mean, the Beatles B-Sides, the singles were better than a lot of artists A-Sides. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, B-sides don't necessarily have to be less quality than the A-side right. or what's no, on the I, album, you know. No, they don't. You're right. But there are some, we know with many bands, there were many times it was clear they mailed it in just to put something on the flip side of a single. Uh, actually, to be technical, the physical single, the picture disc, there is no B-side. It's packaged as if, I guess, it's a double A-side where Home Tonight is side A, in a hurry is side double A. Um, so, you know, in a way, there, here's a case where a single, uh, uh, kind of an old school single, where both songs are expected to be treated as equals. So, Okay. And by the way, the very beginning of In a Hurry has kind of like a harpsichord-ish kind of sound. It reminded me a little bit of Fixing a Hole. I don't know if... Mm. Either of you thought about that? Yes. So, <laughs> okay. I think so. I know what you mean. It, it sounded. Well, I remember when I heard it, and I thought, I, I, oh, I know that. I know that's from somewhere. And then the song develops, and it kind of, you know, distracts, takes you away from that. Yeah. Okay. But for me, those are two dynamite tracks. And sometimes I listen just for his bass playing. I love the sound of his bass on there. Yeah. And at least. Uh, in the meantime, till his next new album of studio material comes out, he gives us these little treats, mm-hmm. a few songs at a time. I've noticed that a lot in the last decade with songs like Hope for the Future and I Want to Come Home and The Blink of an Eye. You know, in between the release of the new album, studio albums, he gives us that to tide us over, right. as well as the archival box sets. Mm-hmm. So. So there you go. Also, I have to include, as Darren did as well, Ringo's tour. It's still a treat for me just to know how much he enjoys going out there. And uh, his bands are always killer, even though there haven't been too many changes in the personnel. Just to see him out there enjoying himself and uh, to know that it's this important for him to keep doing it at his age. I don't take that for granted. And I got to see him at uh, Woodstock, just to be there in that area where the the festival took place in 1969, although he really didn't make any mention of it. (laughs) Hmm. Nor did he make any mention of it being his 30th anniversary of the All-Stars. He did say that um, uh, Greg Raleigh was there when it first happened in 1969, but he didn't dwell on the fact that this was such a historic place that he Mm -hmm. played but just being there in that area and just knowing the history uh seeing a lot of people there were actually fans there that were there in 1969 Mm -hmm. that came to this and you know you just feel proud that you're hanging around these people who shared such such an important part of our history part of our dna woodstock you know (laughs) and um that was a big moment for me. And also seeing him in, in uh, Long Island at Farmingdale. So I saw him twice in, the, in this past year and happy to know I'll be seeing him again this year. So my fifth choice would be, uh, and you mentioned this too, Darren, the video for Above Us Only Sky, which I think was really tremendous. I love all the different interviews that are in there. It's nice to see Julian in the documentary as well as uh, so many people that worked for John and Yoko, like Elliot Mintz, like Dan Richter, you know, Klaus Vormann's in there, a lot of great people uh, being interviewed in the documentary and uh, getting a better understanding of how Imagine was recorded and the collaboration between John and Yoko there. I thought it was very well done. So would you guys like to mention just a couple of honorable mentions? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have any more, honest. To be totally honest with you, I don't. Okay, I don't, Alan? I don't either. No, not really. But I'll just mention a few. Yeah, I have to go along with Darren with the Amoeba gig. I think that was a tremendous oh, yeah. release. The sound quality is amazing. Paul's voice is really powerful throughout. 
Yeah, it's nice to have. And I am really now more than ever longing for another live album from Paul McCartney from his tours because we really haven't had one that reflected his tours since Good Evening New York City. And we're talking 10 years ago already. And there's so much material that he's done from the 2000s through today that he's never released on audio. You know, it's 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 staggering how much there is. Most of it, I would say, is probably Beatles material. And sometimes he'll do something like he'll put four songs from the new album and uh, live recordings will be on the deluxe edition. Same thing with what he did with Egypt Station for live songs um, on the deluxe edition of, of Egypt Station and uh, and the um, Travelers and Explorers edition. But as far as a full like, double disc of uh, live cuts, maybe spanning the last couple of decades, that would be really nice. Because that's for someone who tours as often as Paul, he should have another live album out at this point. Can I be a devil's advocate? Okay, go ahead. Uh, and I would be very, very leery of that because I'm maybe more conscious than I should be of the condition of his voice uh-huh. and it being preserved forever on an album. I can't really listen to Paul is Live because you really hear the wear appearing. And it's even recently I was listening to tracks from Tripping the Live Fantastic and you can hear the wear on his voice. And he clearly was did something to his voice where it improved so that, say, on Back in the U.S. and Back in the World, especially on Good Evening New York City, he sounds better. But... You know, hearing him struggle or sound older or however you is not something that, you know, I'm all that I don't really want to hear. I don't get me wrong. I'd love it, but I'd rather him. I'd rather him retire from performing live and work on studio work, composing, recording albums, you know, because on the studio recordings, he can handle and manage his voice better as evidenced on the new single. Uh huh. Okay, you're not the only one that's expressed that. So, and I different. feel bad. It kills me to say that, but well, I want Paul to do whatever makes him happy, and um, I do believe, although I don't have proof of it, that probably every single concert that he's done has got to be recorded professionally. Probably. And if you if you go through all of his shows, you can find the best. I don't know the best recording of being for the benefit of Mr. Kite vocally. You know, you have to have somebody that goes through all these different concerts to find the best performance overall. But when you think about from the 2000s on and, and just watching the Space Within Us DVD, there are songs from that tour, like I'll Get You and Please Please Me and Too Many People going into She Came In Through the Bathroom Window. That's just that tour alone. Think about all the Beatles songs from All Together Now. I just mentioned Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite. Your Mother Should Know. He's doing Love Me Do these days. There's a lot of Beatles songs in there that he's never released as live recordings audio-wise. And that, along with his more recent material, I, I still think you can find good examples for each song. It might take you know, a lot of work, but I would, I would definitely welcome another live album from him. Because it's part of history. Everything he does is part of history. And there should be something to represent something from certainly the last 10 years. That's just my opinion. It's an interesting point of view. I I totally understand it. And I understand what Darren's saying. Yeah, vocally, it is problematic, but it is also history. And, you know, he'll have documented this stuff. It'll be in his archive. Who knows whether he'll ever, you know, at some point have the archive open for the future to people who want to hear it or whatever. But I would say that there is a degree to which he actually has released some of this stuff. I mean, you know, you look at the Grand Central concert and some of the other concerts, it seems to me that if you put on a televised stereo audio concert, it's as if you are releasing it because fundamentally you are. Everybody is recording it. Everyone who wants it has it. And um, I think, you know, we might have to be content with those for the time being. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there should probably be, whether a specific show or 
idealized by editing between shows. I think there should be an album representing every tour he's done. You know, mm-hmm. um, I mean, some of the earliest ones aren't either. I mean, there there are only two known recordings of the university tour, and they're both like horrible recordings. Uh, you know, in terms of they're made by a kid with a microphone in the audience. Um, but, uh, you know, and I don't think he recorded those professionally, but from then on, I think he did record everything professionally. So, you know, there's the European tour in 72 that, um, you know, we just got some of via Bruce McMouse and, uh, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, some of these things are beginning to come out, but I I really would like to see actually in terms of live recordings from him, you know, whether or not I would find them necessarily the most enjoyable thing to put on or not, but simply for historical reasons, every single stage set that he's done documented on release, you know, and the thing is that since his, stage sets are relatively static, you know, with a couple of songs changing now. And then it's not like if you were to say that about, say, Jimi Hendrix, you know, you would have a gazillion disc set, you know, Mm. even as short as he played. But with McCartney, really, you know, one disc from one, not one disc, one, like probably three disc set from each Mm -hmm. (laughs) at this point from each tour would do it because I think, Live performance has been an important part of his career. There's been, you know, huge periods when he didn't do any, but now he is. And I think if you want to look at his career in perspective, the live shows are a big part of it. And let's face it, they've been really lucrative for him. One of the things I wrote down on my 2019 list is that in April, Polestar reported that he topped the global concert Pulse chart, taking in an average gross of $3.6 million per show uh, Mm. for an average of 31,979 tickets. And that's an average. So there are things like, you know, when he played in Sao Paulo, he took in $9 million for two shows with 90,000 people at each show. You know, I, I can see why Darren says, you know, he should stop live performance and concentrate on albums. I think from an artistic point of view, that is an absolutely sound bit of advice. Um, but there are 90,000 people in the past year for each of those two shows who wanted to see him. You know, a lot of people want to see him. They understand that his voice is not what it was in 1965. And, uh, you know, they just want to go see him play the songs that they know and love and maybe some songs that they don't know as well as they should and might want to look into. There are lots of reasons for him to be doing it. But I also do agree with Darren that it it would probably be better for him to focus a bit more on studio creation now because his albums like are not as plentiful as they used to be. You know, they take a few years in between partly because he's touring. So... Yeah, yeah, these are all different points of view, and they're all valid. Yeah. You know, the the selfish part of me wishes that he wouldn't tour at all and make as many albums as he can. But then, what about all the people around the world, especially young fans, just discovering his music, discovering the Beatles, discovering his solo music that have never seen him ever? So you can't deny them the opportunity if he decides to come around in whatever part of the world he wants to perform in. So. Well, you know, I have this nice, cozy little studio up here in Portland, and I think really he should come here and record so that I can see him live and he can get some recording done. How's that? I think there'll be millions of fans (laughs) who would build a studio for him if he would do that. (laughs) I actually have felt this way about Ringo's tours in recent years, that the live albums, and there were it seemed like almost every tour Ringo was putting a live All Star Band album out. That it was becoming a little redundant, and it stopped. And he loves this band that he's got, uh, at least the core of it, which has now come down to Steve Lukather and Greg Raleigh. He's never documented any of the recent tours, and by recent, when the last album came out, what tour it, it, it represented. But there's a lot of catching up in that department where he could, should do a volume two of his live an, all-star band anthology. 
Yep. Yep. I agree with you. Mm. All right. A few more things I'll mention uh, would be the reissue of McGear when that came out uh, this past year with bonus material. That was a nice treat just to acknowledge that album. It sounds fantastic. There's a whole disc there of bonus material and B sides to singles that weren't even from that period from Mike's uh, career. And uh, as we're doing this show, it's Mike McCartney's birthday. Happy birthday to you, Michael. 76, by the way, today. Um, Ken Womack's book on Abbey Road, Solid State, I enjoyed a lot, as I did Ken McNabb's book. And in the end, he was a great guest on our show. And as you mentioned, Darren Terry Crane's book called NEMS and the Business of Selling Beatles Merchandise. Also, Peter Asher's book is a fun read. Yes. We just had him on. The Beatles from A to Z. And, uh, and Ken Mansfield. And Ken, what? Well, actually, that was yeah, 2018. 2018. I think, but, yeah. Was it? Yeah. Because the, the point of the book was about the um, rooftop, rooftop concert. Yeah. Yeah. It came out a couple of months, like towards the end of 2018. Ah, okay. In advance of that 50th yeah. anniversary. I also will Which mention. Which confusing with the 50th of Let It Be. That when the get back anniversary rolls around at the end of the month, you've got to remind yourself this is a 51st anniversary <laughs> as opposed to the whole let it be thing, which is 50. Anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> One thing I just want to mention that I did not get a chance to see, and I don't think either any of us have, is um, a documentary called An Accidental Studio, which is all about the history of handmade films. Mm-hmm. It hasn't come out here in any way on DVD or Blu-ray. But it was released in the UK. So uh, if any of our listeners have seen it, let us know. Write to us what they thought of it. So let's just do a quick rundown of what we'd like to see in 2020. We get to mention one thing from each of the solo Beatles and one group. I mean, we don't really have much of a choice where the group is concerned. We know it's about to happen. But uh, let's hear from you first, Alan. Okay, well, you know, obviously all of the Let It Be activities uh, are, are going to be the group thing. And so the one thing we don't know is what they're going to do about the audio. And, you know, at this point, you know, all of the material from Let It Be is out there on various bootlegs. Probably the most concise way to get it is AB Road, which is, I think, 87 CDs that have edited both the A and B Nagger rolls together. I can't imagine Apple putting out something like 87 CDs, you know, legitimately, but um, that would be cool. <laughs> but, you know, there are, there. I, I think that, you know, the point of Let It Be and, and those takes is that they show an album coming together from scratch, from start to finish. You hear songs being written. You hear Paul dictating the lyrics to get back as they keep changing. And, you know, the thing where John says is Tucson in Arizona, you know. Uh, And Paul saying, yeah, that's where they did High Chaparral. You know, great stuff like that. I hope that kind of thing is included. I hope what they do is... They show us, you know, some of the songs coming together through the the many versions that, you know, starting with, you know, Paul coming in and calling the chords, you know, to a song and then it, it taking shape. You know, there's a lot of that. Uh, there, maybe they could include some more of the George songs that were tried during the Let It Be sessions but never really finished. Obviously, a lot of the stuff is very unpolished, but I think that they can... They can explain that. They can explain what the recordings are, what the situation was, and I think people will understand uh, that, you know, it's going to be a bit off the cuff in a lot of cases. And then, you know, towards the end of the sessions, they've got many, many takes of all of the songs. Maybe they should give us some alternates of uh, some of the ones we know. So that's the group. For Paul, obviously what I would really like him to do and within the next couple of months, if possible, is put out all of the outtakes from 1969 to 73, which is the first volume of the book. And, you know, it would be good for us to check uh, various (laughs) things, um, you know, with uh, paperwork and all that. Um, Anyway, 
so that Paul, you know, he did mention, you know, to be serious, he did mention this idea of putting together an outtakes album. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be everything. He says that his uh, cataloger uh, tells him that he's got, you know, over a thousand tracks that are unreleased. I think uh, the idea of putting out some of that would be great. For George, we have not had an archival release from George in a very long time. And, um, you know, the, the what was the one that came out with, when the Scorsese film came out? Was it called First Takes or something? It was, early it, Takes. Early one. Takes, yeah. We obviously need at least volume two. You know, there is a lot of George stuff that deserves a release, you know, just judging what's come out on bootleg and things, you know, there are some, some lovely things out there and I'm sure there's you know, tons of stuff that we haven't heard. Um, I wouldn't mind, uh, like in all things must pass box set with, um, you know, some of the stuff maybe without the, the specter production, you know, you, you can hear a bit more clearly what's going on on those songs on some of the demos and, mm -hmm. uh, and early studio takes, uh, so that's George Ringo. Okay, so when he put out uh, What's My Name, he said, this is going to be my last studio album. No one cares about whole albums anymore. And uh, okay, fine. I'm not sure I agree with that reasoning, but it would be cool if Ringo decided to keep recording and think of his career in a different way. So if, you know, every few months when he had material that he liked he put out maybe a five song ep if that's what what he thinks is a better idea than an lp but maybe a couple of those a year that would be cool john we've had quite a number of archival things over the year but i think the imagine box was so well done that it makes me think that that should be done for all his stuff and i would go back and start with the plastic ono band and have a box set with some outtakes and in process takes and all the kind of stuff that the Imagine set got because that's in some ways, uh, in, in some ways, I like that album better. Plastic Ono Band, it's grittier. It's, uh, I think, I think John liked it better too. I think he once described Imagine as kind of like Plastic Ono Band but sugar coated. So, I'd like to hear that. And I think that is all of them, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Great suggestions. All right, Darren, how about you? Uh, yeah, I have a bunch of things. Uh, let it be needless to say, uh, from the Beatles standpoint, chomping at the bit for what they do with let it be. And I hope it includes the original movie. I have a funny feeling it's not going to, I say it, it being whatever series of releases for the 50th anniversary do come out. I just have this feeling with Peter Jackson's movie, Ultimately, the original film is going to end up getting forgotten. But you say that the uh, last word was that it was coming out. It just yeah. seems as though what, what Peter Jackson is doing is creating, at least from what I gather, he's creating a new Let It Be that makes Apple happy in 2020. But I could be wrong. But there'll always um, be those fans but, uh, that, want, yeah, sure. that want to see the original. I know, and we all want, you know, everything to come out. And, I mean, I never thought the Christmas messages would ever get released. So I guess you could say never say never. So it probably, maybe it does come out, and I'm wrong. I'll be happy about that. I'll be gladly wrong. But I just, I just don't have this feeling it's not going to happen, the original movie. Uh, but, of course, that's the main thing I'm looking forward to in 2020, the, the Let It Be releases. I love some of the ideas you guys came up with uh, already. I would like to see an all-star band, uh, as I mentioned before, live collection, giving highlights of the recent years, whatever, however you want to define recent years. And uh, Alan mentioned um, what could happen out of the John Lennon camp. Uh, I'd love to think that Imagine, the box set and the reissue, uh, would be the start of expanded editions of his uh, sol John solo albums, starting next with the Plastic Ono Band album. Uh, Mind Games, of course, maybe combine. Maybe you could do sort of a massive Men Love Avenue type deal where uh, Mind Games, Walls and Bridges and Rock and Roll could be lumped in as one multi-disc set chronicling that period in Lennon's solo career. And... Uh, 
And down the line, I know this won't have, well, who knows? I shouldn't say won't. We unfortunately have a very sad anniversary waiting for us at the end of 2020. But uh, some sort of uh, uh, package of uh, John and Yoko's Double Fantasy Milk and Honey sessions where the uh, original albums are combined and we get to hear more of what went down uh, during that, uh, during those sessions in the summer, late summer of uh, 80. Uh, so those would be things, those are more kind of wishful thinking releases, although I do think it's very possible that something will from Johnny's birthday later in the year and, of course, the 40th anniversary of his death, and maybe it is going to be a 50th anniversary release of the Plastic Ono Band album. I know I'm jumping around and I'm kind of rambling now as I think of things, something else that I'd love to see happen. I'd love to see Ringo take his entire back catalog and reissue everything as has been the case with uh, John's and George's and Paul gradually doing the same. I think mm. Ringo's album deserve to get nice deluxe treatments, whether or not it's just the Apple albums or however reissues of the other albums with, you know, with record company who owns tapes and whatnot. That would be cool. But uh, what I think is realistic other than let it be, and we know about flaming pie is I think there's a real possibility something special could be coming from Lennon at the end of the year, from Yoko and the John Lennon camp. And uh, that would be something I would really, really welcome. That I think that is, could very possibly could uh, be a reality. Mm-hmm. Okay. Did you say anything for Paul other than Flaming Pie, which we know will come out? When it comes to Paul, I think the fact that Flaming Pie is coming out, I, you know, I think that's going to do it for the archive. Be interesting to see with the projects that he's in, involved with the musical. What it, it's a wonderful life. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a feeling that that uh, uh, Paul's going to be opening those doors of not necessarily uh, another classical work, but not necessarily rock projects. That I uh, I have this feeling, but by the end of the year with the musical, that may open up. Uh, you know, some other avenues for Paul. Some other musical avenues. Uh, later in the year. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me, actually, if by the end of the year, Paul's releasing maybe It's a Wonderful Life, uh, a cast recording or a soundtrack recording. Yeah, he was saying the end of 2020 or early 2021 for that. So, And what about George? I actually don't know if we're going to see anything anytime soon. And all things must pass, Box, it's great. But mm-hmm. when, uh, when I interviewed Danny Harrison at WFUV, uh, when his... Uh, recent solo album came out i got the impression that there wasn't going to be any anything happening anytime soon in his archives for his archives and i got the impression that it really was would not have been something that george would have been terribly interested in seeing all these outtakes and all this stuff come out and it didn't sound like something that uh that danny or or olivia were interested in doing let what's there that's the work that's what you know that's what should be out and that's that's the final word mm. uh but i could be wrong but that's the impression i got a couple of years ago when i interviewed danny that at that point no there wasn't anything no activity no releases no box sets etc so you know what's what's really strange is that i know for a fact that several years ago i read an interview with giles martin where he said he was working on the follow-up to early takes, you know, so he was, he was listening to some of the unreleased George Harrison music. So I don't know whatever became of that because he's so busy yeah. with all of his other projects, but he was starting something there. So yeah, who knows? All right. As for my picks with the Beatles, obviously the let it be stuff. I don't know exactly how many CDs we should expect. I think so much about the rehearsals and, what would be the most sense if you've got, what was it, 87 CDs of bootleg material, Alan? Something like, something like that, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> if, we, if we got three discs of that stuff, of the finest of that material, I think that would, that would make me very happy. And then I completely forgot about just the studio outtakes of the songs mm-hmm. of, of Let It Be, like you said. So that would be really sweet. Mm-hmm. And please uh, fill the CDs up to 78, 79, 80 minutes. Right. <laughs> That's true, yeah. John Lennon, uh, I remember hearing years ago, and you could probably go back to our show a year ago, 
where I mentioned the one-to-one benefit concerts were being worked on. I know Jack Jack Douglas told me he was working on it. So I don't know what's happening with that. Um, I don't know how much. See, now we're so used to think about thinking about anniversaries. The Beatles stuff, the group stuff, yes, everything's being done with 50th anniversaries. The solo stuff, they don't really operate that way. None of McCartney's remastered box sets are tied into anniversaries. He didn't do a Back to the Egg for last year, which would have been the 40th anniversary. I don't know how much thought is being put into anniversaries with the solo projects. But yeah, it would make a lot of sense if you want to do something for the 50th anniversary of Plastic Ono Band. And like both of you, I was so impressed with what they did with Imagine. I'd like to see that happen with all of John's solo stuff, even sometime in New York City, even though a lot of people look at that as his weakest of his well, albums. But pardon, it should be done. Yeah, and when you consider the fact that there's so few albums, unfortunately, that John was able to record in his short lifetime, they're all even the more important to me for that reason. I'd love to see a Mind Games box set and a Walls and Bridges box set and a Rock and Roll box set and maybe something to tie Double Fantasy and Milk and Honey together or make them separate releases. And not only that, you know, one of my favorite moments on the radio certainly when I was on the air in New Jersey, when I did my show there, was listening to the Lost Lennon Tapes radio series and hearing all the unreleased stuff, whether it's alternate takes or different mixes of John's stuff, but most especially the unreleased songs, especially in the last five years of John's life. And there's a lot of those songs that still haven't even been released commercially, although it's out on bootleg. You know, there's a lot of great songs there that I like, and I find them fascinating because whether they were finished or being close to finish, you saw that they had potential songs like whatever happened to she is a friend of dorothy's memories or what they sometimes call tennessee you know there's a lot of songs like that i'd like to see a single disc of that whether it's just john's demos of those songs or you know one of my facebook friends has suggested getting artists together to cover those songs that they can come out you know Mm -hmm. this is john lennon i think everything that he ever wrote should come out musically and there's still those songs believe it or not even with all the stuff that yoko's done with bonus tracks with the john lennon anthology box set there's still a lot of those songs hanging around from those last five years of john's life that haven't seen the light of day commercially okay so i'd like to see something being being done with that but uh only because i heard about the one-to-one concerts being worked on the last few years i can't imagine anything coming before that although I welcome anything, you know. Paul McCartney's the toughest here to to say anything about because we know about Flaming Pie. I'd love to see another studio album come from him, but that's not going to happen probably for another few years. We know about It's a Wonderful Life. That'll happen the end of this year, early next year. And then he's also got his animated film that he's still working on with High in the Clouds. But um, I'd love to see a disc or two of unreleased songs from him, but... He's handling all of that through his archive box sets. They all turn up there instead of a separate release like Cold Cuts was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it would be nice if with all this talk about the Beatles 50th anniversary, since it's 50 years since 1970, if we could address all the solo releases of that year and do something for the 50th anniversary. But I can't see a box set for Sentimental Journey. Or for Bukus of Blues, I'd love to see it, but I don't know how much unreleased stuff there is, if anything, other than the few bootleg songs that have come out, like Stormy Weather from Sentimental Journey, for example. I don't know how many outtakes there could be from something like that. I'd love to see, you know, all the solo Beatles stuff from John, George, and Ringo being given a similar treatment to what Paul's doing. I love the fact that Paul is acknowledging all of his solo work and putting out box sets for everything do you think all the other solo works are worthy of that it's all a matter of opinion here but i'd love to see something being done with ringo's solo catalog like you said darren reissued remastered some of them really need to be cleaned up sound wise especially as late 70s stuff i think there should definitely be something for the ringo album from 73 some kind of box set for that but um yeah i would love to see something being done from Ringo's solo catalog, new reissues, new remasters. I'd welcome any of his albums that way. Okay. And as for George, 
either early takes volume two, something for all things must pass. You know, you, you've got the bootleg there of Beware of Abco. You've got all that material there. You can do different takes of songs from All Things Must Pass, I guess. And since so many people are really loving those songs without the Phil Spector production, it's nice to, to have the contrast there, to have that and the Phil Spector produced songs. I'd love to see something real special being done with All Things Must Pass. But most of all, when it comes to George, the one thing I wish would come out would be something from the, the 74 North American tour. Because it's such a, an important part of his history. And because he only did that tour and the tour of Japan with a few other things in between. The concert for Bangladesh, of course, being major. But um, so few live performances from George. And I'd love something to come out from the 74 tour, even if George's voice was not the, the best of shape for history's sake. Mm-hmm. I'd love to see something come out from there. Mm-hmm. Those are my wishes. Okay. They should all listen right. to all of us. Uh, <laughs> so right now, Paul and Ringo are saying they're wasting their time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. So that puts a wrap on this show. Uh, we will each give our own contact information, beginning with you, Alan. The easiest way to reach me is on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can contact all of us care of the show on things we said today radio show at gmail.com that's email address things we said today radio show at gmail.com and you can also follow us on twitter at at things we said fab and we have a facebook page which is things we said today beatles radio fans there's also a things we said today facebook page but the super official one is things we said today beatles radio fans mm, okay darren you can send me an email at wfuv at darren devivo at wfuv.org or go to facebook and like uh my radio page which is darren devivo on wfuv radio uh, i have a personal page as well but i would prefer if you we go over to the uh, on WFUV radio page and l- click like, and we'll be all set. Okay. As for me, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net if you want to reach me directly. Everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Make sure you uh, check out my weekly Beatles trivia where you can win one of nine great prizes like Peter Asher's new book, Ken Womack's new book. Uh, the recent uh, packaging of the Imagine and Give Me Some Truth documentaries you can win on DVD or Blu-ray. Some great prizes to be won on that page. Also, um, as we said earlier in the show, if you want to hear uh, either our interview that we did on this show with Neil Innes, you can find that on our Podbean site or YouTube or iTunes. It's show number 263. Great interviews on my website as well, not only with Neil, but recently with Mike McCartney, Ken Womack, Ken McNabb, a whole bunch of great people. And uh, that's all on the website right there. And uh, I will mention, since I just said the trivia page this week on my trivia page, since uh, this is the anniversary of the Beatles' DECA audition recordings, it's a trivia question about that. So, uh, again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay, so this has been a great show. Looking back and looking forward for Beatle fans. I always like doing both in the same show. And for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening. Again, Happy New Year to you all. And we will see you next time. Next time.